doing like an antiques roadshow of people with their own, bringing their own gems of Americana. And so today's going to be mostly me talking just to set the table, but maybe once the table's set, we can have a banquet together, you know? Absolutely. Okay. That's, that sounds wonderful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know we've got lots of things to share, everybody. <laughs> Are you, so you're all in South Dakota? Um, I'm in South Dakota. Uh, my name is Rochelle. I work at the Vermilion, Vermilion Public Library. Uh, huh. Eric is from New Jersey. And okay. we have people from all over the country joining us today. So <laughs> I'm from Penn State, State College. All right. Really? But I used to live them. in Wyoming. I lived in Wyoming in the 70s. So automatically, I'm going to tweak the presentation because I have had a general foundation, but I wanted to be relevant to South Dakota. <laughs> But so far, here's someone from Pennsylvania, South Carolina, and here I am from New Jersey. So uh, <laughs> we're at the end of it, I'm going to give a little preview. Uh, it's uh, about a smart narrative, a smart community narrative, and that it's our stories and these recollections are something much bigger and something that's relevant to the times. But I, I don't want to step on Rochelle's pose here and uh, I'll, I'll have it's plenty fine. of time to talk. This is your turn now. It's kind of the nature of the the platform we're using. If this were in person, yeah, of course, we would probably have mostly South Dakota people here. But since right. we're able to have this virtually, we've got people we can expand our audience. <laughs> it, it's wonderful. I, you know, I was a fan of the late Charles Kuralt and how he visited a small community and oh, I love it. yeah, and I'll get into that a little bit uh, later. But the, the idea of a community or now community being redefined, uh, you know, look, look, the hidden America, and I'll get into that. What it represented when I started this 30 years ago, and what I think it means now, and it's uh, you know, uh, tying the dust together. I think, but it can be a window of opportunity, and that's where I'll circle back to Rochelle and you know, <clears throat> the opportunities that might flow from this. Okay. I see people are sharing where all, where all they're from, and I really appreciate that. If you all want, if anybody wants to um, put like in the chat box where you're from, you can. Uh, I've got Pennsylvania, South Dakota, New Hampshire, South several people from South Carolina, California, Oklahoma. Yeah, let's see. Rhode Island, Virginia, California, another Oklahoma. Yeah, oh, Vermillion. That's good. Got one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not alone. <laughs> yeah. Somebody likes you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Got Virginia, South Dakota, PA. All right. So, uh, so this class will try and have it be about an hour long. We you say? Um, I mean, it's okay with me if it goes a little bit over, but I understand everybody will you know, have other things that they need to do. And of course, we are going to be recording this presentation. So if anybody does have to leave early, you can, and I'll send out a link to this video um, afterwards, hopefully right after this video, if I can, if I don't have any computer issues. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and start talking. Um, my name is Rochelle Langdon. I'm also admitting people from the waiting room. So my attention is a little divided. Uh, my name is Rochelle Langdon. I am here at the Vermilion Public Library in South Dakota. I'm in charge of adult programming. Some of you do know me, uh, but a lot of you don't because a lot of you are from very far away. Uh, and so today I ha have uh, Eric Modell here who uh, does a series of presentations on journeys into Hidden America or other locations. And today he is going to talk about the hidden gems of Americana. And I'm going to go ahead and mute everyone but myself. I'm sorry, Eric, I accidentally muted you, but if you want to unmute yourself. <laughs> um, everybody, I would like to remain muted um, while we're doing the presentation so that uh, we don't have any background noise uh, interacting with and interrupting anything. Uh, I, I, if we have time, we'll, we, he, we might be able to have time for people to share stories, but otherwise we might just have to do another one of these in order to have people talk and, and just share stories like Eric said earlier, do an antiques roadshow kind of uh, 
program, if you will. So for now, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Eric. Eric, go, go ahead. Thank you. And thank you so much for putting this together. And thank you for your library and libraries on top of it. Uh, I was going to save this for the end, but during, especially during this time of this virtual world that we're living at, uh, libraries have become a lifeline. And there's a lot there we're talking about of opportunities there. They, they, you're not about books anymore, but it's you're truly a resource center and a way of making community within a community, but beyond. So thank you for that. And thank you everyone for coming. A uh, couple of things. I come from near New York City. I'm apt when I'm enthused to talk too rapidly. And I have a whole bunch of slides and not a lot of time. So my apologies in advance. If I'm going quickly, it's because I'm trying to set the, the table for the opportunity to not have me just talk, but have us all have conversations together. One other preliminary thing, and I'll get more into it in a bit. Hidden America, I started some 30, 35 years ago. I've done a syndicated column, books, radio features, and the like, and then online services. And at that time, it was Hidden America uh, in the Charles Corral sense, these gems of Americana that lie beyond the interstate. Without getting into politics in the world that we're in, because I'd like this to be a sanctuary from it, so to speak, uh, what's hidden now, and I hope that we can tap into it, is uh, uh, I was watching Perry Como before on YouTube, and I loved him as a, when I was a little kid. I used to have a Perry Como sweater, and I sat on a little stool like he did, and uh, it brought back a flood of memories, not just the songs and my life for Perry Como, but what the world was about. And there were conversations, there was a tone, and I'll, I'll tap into it in a little bit. And... Uh, I have three kids, they're in their teens and their 20s, and the world they live in is a very different world than what we lived in. And I think that world and a lot from it is hidden right now. I'm not passing judgment whether one's better or worse. In fact, we do a troika of sessions, remembering a community. The second one is uh, the good old days, then or, then or now, and the third one is creating a vision for the future. So but what's hidden is, and I hope to unveil a little bit and explore with you, is that tone that we we're talking about, the tone of civility, the tone of respect. Uh, I'm from New Jersey, and we're the butt end of uh, jokes very often. And uh, talking to Rochelle, uh, South Dakota has to defend itself all too often in the eyes of too many people. So, and I know I knew very little about South, South Dakota. And I don't know how much people know about New Jersey other than the stereotypical things that you hear in the, the national media. So hoping this is an opportunity for us to, uh, to explore together, to learn from one another. So I'm presenting a lot of slides as a background. I hope we have time today, but if not, maybe we can have a, a part two, the Antiques Roadshow, where we can share together. So with that having said, uh, this is a virtual journey to hidden America from a social distance. The tagline is Explorations of the Offbeat off the beaten path, overlooked and forgotten. And uh, in the spirit of the late Charles Corral, I was drawn to open roads and what would lie beyond the bend and beyond the interstate. I was weaned in a, an era where before those GPS, there was our local SO station. And I was the kid in the front seat next to my dad. The girls were in the back. I was on, on the, uh, the front seat with the map. Even though my dad knew exactly where he was going, he would let me be armed with a roadmap. And it's about main streets, the imagery there, and um, one place was distinctive over another. This is not just in the countries, but in the city. This happens to be a street scene in Baltimore, uh, the row houses that Baltimore is famous for, among other things. And this is a street in Maine. Here's a picture of Charles Corralt, and I love following him, the on the road. And uh, that's the type of travel I wanted to do. Our, our travel agency, Liberty Travel, closed here after 60 years. And as a kid, my, my parents used to book trips and it was to the conventional, uh, conventional tourist areas. And I loved traveling, but once I got there, I said, isn't there more to, the, to it than that? Uh, the, the Hilton Hotels, we did the Disneyland vacation. And uh, I got this feel, I said, this is not necessarily, I'm not experiencing what I saw on TV or what Charles Carroll would. And, Here's, here's the imagery of the on the road. This is on the road van where he traveled. And uh, one of the inspirations for this, for Hidden America, was something called the Book of the 50 States. This came out of the, the 1980s. These were two journalists. And what they did is they explored the states based upon the history, the political culture at the time, and going into the culture, what made Vermont different than South Dakota? What made New Jersey different than New Mexico? and uh, sort of a, a C-SPAN before its time. But I was fascinated by the fact that, uh, I don't have to speak too much about what the 
folks, you know, what the political culture here is in New Jersey, it's, it's notorious and, uh, you know. Hey, tried, uh, I'm, Eric, tried, I'm sorry. Yep. Uh, I have somebody asking if you can, would you be able to make these photos bigger by putting them into, like maybe putting the, the PowerPoint into presentation mode or, or is, is there a slideshow mode you can make these bigger in? Uh, let me see if I can find it, let's see. Do, 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 do. Would you click on slideshow? Yeah. Slideshow, okay. there it is and. Play from. There. Is that better? Oh, sorry, started over, but <laughs> sorry about okay. that. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. All righty. Here's the scenes of, and here's Charles Corral on the road. And here's the book that I was talking about, the book of America inside the 50 states that distinguish one place from another and had me appreciate how diverse and how different places were uh, in, in terms of culture, why one place was different than the other. We would see that a bit when it be, would be an election year in terms of electoral votes and we would hear about it about Iowa and New Hampshire, but uh, each state has its own culture and, and it's secret sauce. I was also inspired by the uh, WPA Guide to America, which uh, comes out of the, the 1930s. And I'll get into a, a bit there. There's very little about South Dakota in both books and I'm um, hoping to be able to, to learn as well as to present. But there's a paragraph I'll, I'll read to you a little later about uh, South Dakota. A couple of the Depression era scenes. This is the American Island Park in, in South Dakota, and it was flooded to make way for a dam. More about the uh, idiosyncrasies and the, uh, the special gems that can be found in South Dakota. This is another book that inspired me. Our Towns, a 100,000 mile journey into the heart of America. The authors were James Fallows uh, from the uh, Atlantic magazine, and uh, he's in semi-retirement, and what, uh, he's a flyer, and what he did was he traveled in planes into small airports, and he and his wife would uh, have a checklist of items that they would look for in, in terms of quality of life in a community. What made one community work as opposed to another one was perhaps trying to play catch up from uh, cafes to bookstores to public libraries were an important aspect there. What a good public library meant to the uh, quality of life in a community. In addition to Charles Kuralt, I was a big fan of Blake Wobegon when it was on uh, Garrison Killer, uh, a Prairie Home Companion, and he had a picture book that came out in search of Lake Wobegon, which was inspired by his radio monologues, and uh, I think it was all imagery, the, the little town that time forgot, the decades cannot improve, and uh, uh, I was inspired by, this, by the scenes in that book, and hopefully we can come across that. Uh, on a personal level, I wanted to share with you some of the images in terms of my notion of uh, the on the road. This is what I grew up with before there was uh, Sirius XM radio and before there was Spotify. It was the AM radio. And uh, in, in addition to being armed with the map, I was allowed to change the station. My family came out, made the great migration from New York City to five miles away in New Jersey. But to my mom, it was like moving from uh, the East Coast to, to Wyoming. But uh, that was the George Washington Bridge, 1950s vintage making the track from New York City to New Jersey. This is the house I was born in. They moved in in 1951, part of the post-World War II generation, the, gen the greatest generation. Uh, my mom passed away in 2017, and she lived in that house for some 66 years, and it was my job to, to clean it out. And I came across artifacts, uh, big and small. Each had a story to tell from my dad's uh, service in the Navy during World War II to starting a family. One of their favorite song was from Guy Lombardo, uh, Our Little Ran Ranch House. And that was their, their ranch house. So uh, I grew up in our town. We were about 10 miles away from Yankee Stadium. And that's a picture of the old Yankee Stadium. And that's Mickey Mantle. And it was an era before million dollar contracts where the baseball players had winter jobs and the players used to live in town. We were a solidly middle-class community. Now they would be living in a community with multi-million dollar homes. So Mickey Mantle lived in town and we used to scurry to, to get their autographs. Uh, I mustered up the strength and courage to get an autograph and I rang the doorbell and no words would come out of my mouth. I was so starstruck by it. But uh, we lived here and it was about a bus ride away to New York City, 55 cents on the bus, but more locally, if we wanted to go to the movie, it was before the malls, and this was Hackensack, New Jersey, and had the Fox and the Oratani Theater. You could spend an afternoon going to a couple of local department stores. If you notice on the on the marquee there, it's Rock Hudson and Doris Day, Lover Come Back with Tony Randall, and uh, other previews included The King and I and Carousel, so that was uh, early 1960s. Then that was replaced by a shopping center. This is one of the earliest ones, the Garden State Mall. If, uh, you can see the remnants of a J.C. Penney sign, Bamberger's was the regional department store, which was part of the Macy's chain. Uh, 
I was influenced, and I guess this is a segue in terms of personal history, but also collective. Uh, I was talking earlier about making community and how it's, uh, I say, off beat, off the beaten path, overlooked and forgotten. Perhaps overlooked is the fact now in our niche society with how many cable stations, 500 cable channels, and everyone with their own personalized music list. We don't have those, as many shared experiences as we used to. And one can make a case in terms of the parallel worlds, depending on one's political inclination. But this, these, this is a picture of the immigrants uh, coming from Ellis Island, taking a look at, uh, the, at New York City, which lurks beyond. I was influenced again by the Great Depression. Uh, that's the imagery there of a, a store for, for lease. World War II, my dad was in the service, first in the uh, Atlantic Theater for Iceland and uh, in England, protecting ships, the, the convoys going across the, the Atlantic, and then in the, uh, in the Pacific after that. And uh, the Great Depression and the World War II had a great impact. This is what was going on, a sample of on the home front there, service on the home front, and of course I am, I'm patriotic as can be, and the ration points won't worry me. Growing up, I heard from my parents in terms of the role of radio. Uh, it was like the hearth, the fireplace, and uh, Fibber McGee and uh, Fibber McGee and uh, Bob Hope and Bing Crosby and uh, Al Jolson and, and on and on. Uh, that was then replaced by the 1950s, the black and white uh, television. And uh, I recall, I don't know if you do, Ed Sullivan, not just for introducing the Beatles, but uh, I remember the the older generation watching as well the likes of Jimmy Durante and uh, uh, Bing Crosby again and uh, young and old. Uh, we were a generation raised on patriotism. This is, uh, I was looking for an image of the, the, the human flag for July 4th, but uh, this is the human liberty bell. And uh, that was from uh, what, uh, Camp Dix, which was later Fort Dix. It has a, a new name now, uh, but that was in New Jersey. Imagery of July 4th in towns big and small, and trying to get at the feeling that, that we have when we are neighbors, even more so on July 4th, to, to be able to tap into that, that, that it's not just on July 4th, and, but on other occasions, and it, it's all too rare where we get that feeling to connect, whether it's neighbors or, or greater neighbors. Some of the other imagery that used to bound people together, the, the, the uh, Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, and this looks like it's, I think, 1930s, perhaps, one of the earliest parades there, if you notice, going through Times Square. And that's a, an early version of Mickey Mouse, Kentucky Fried Chicken. I was a, my dad was in the insurance business and had a convention, and I, it was 1967, 68, and who's in the place but the Colonel, the, the, going down the stairway there. And uh, talk about celebrities, that was the original Colonel, but... Uh, I guess Kentucky Fried Chicken's a little different now with Popeyes, but uh, Colonel Sanders was was a celebrity. We have a generation that that traveled by car. Uh, that's a 1940s car, but the, the back roads beyond the interstate. That was the name of the book, and I was influenced again not just by the TV being located in the house, but but the programming as well. And it was the the Leave It to Beaver generation, along with Ozzie and Harriet and. Uh, like Andy Griffith later on, and Andy Griffith was not just entertainment, but it introduced me to the uh, the appeal of the small town and rural values as well. Just the image of uh, Andy and Opie going fishing. Got to tell you a story. I've been doing uh, uh, consultation work for communities, and one of the fascinating stories was BP, the the oil company back in they first came into the U.S here in the 1980s or 90s, and well, they wanted to become known as a hometown neighbor, but they had a British accent. And what they did was they went about sponsoring trout fishing derbies in small towns, and uh, they tapped into that whole notion of Andy Griffith walking with Opie. They wanted to take advantage of that to say, look, we understand your values. Uh, we we want to be part of your community. So that impacted them as well as it did me. Again, I grew up uh, Dinah Shore. We used to sing a about seeing the USA in your Chevrolet, and uh, there is the Sh Chevrolet convertible, 1950s version with Golden Gate Bridge in the background. Along the highways before McDonald's was the Howard Johnson's with the 28 flavors. I met my wife, and one of her best recollections was the mint chocolate chip. So when we were driving, we'd look for, there were very few left at the time, but the remaining Howard Johnson's to see if we could find the mint chocolate chip ice cream. Uh, we had one of the earliest McDonald's. Notice the prices on the menu there. 15 cent hamburger, cheeseburger, 19 cents, orange aid, 10 cents. 
I mentioned to you the bus fare going into New York from here, 50 cents at the time, that bus now is about $7.25. Again, the shared imagery, George Washington. This image is the transcontinental railroad, what it meant in terms of telegraph services, what it meant in terms of the role of the railroad to travel, and not just the travel, but what, how one traveled uh, from the Pullman cars, the dining service, how people dressed up to travel. Again, the, the role of the radio, the national networks, whether it was NBC, uh, it was the blue and red networks, uh, or it was CBS, uh, Edward R. Murrow, uh, in terms of his World War II. Again, one of the ways bringing this together was the interstate highway system, the Eisenhower interstate highway system. There are pluses and minuses to it. Again, uh, here's a, a Walter Cronkite, the role of the evening news. Uh, no matter where, what our perspective was, we had a, a common narrative at the time to work off of whether one liked it or didn't like it. And uh, again, here's the interstate highway system. The counterpoint to that was my kids enjoyed the movie Cars. Here's the main street that was bypassed by the interstate highway. And the song that really resonated uh, with James Taylor singing not long, but not so very long ago, the world was a different place. Yes, it was. You settled down, build a town, made it. You watched it grow. It was your town. Time goes by. Time brings changes. You change too. Nothing comes that you can't handle. You never see it coming when the world caves in on you. Your town, nothing you can do. Main Street isn't Main Street anymore. The lights don't shine as brightly as they shone before to tell the truth. They don't shine at all. In our town, sun comes up every morning just like it's always done. You go to work, start the day, open up for business. It's never going to come. So the world goes by a million miles away. Main Street isn't Main Street anymore. No one seems to need us like they did before. It's hard to find a reason to left to stay, but, it, but it's our town. Love it anyway. Come what it may, it's our town. And what I'm hoping to get at here. Here's the imagery now. In today's world, everyone is grouped into what they're thinking of, whether it's the red and blue on the right, whether it's about cats or whether it's about uh, basketball. And this is a hope to create that town square feeling. Book that inspired me was The, the Death and Life of Main Street, Small Towns in American Memory, Space, and Community. And that's what I'm hoping to get at in this discussion about the idea of memory, that space. Main Street is a space, but it's a state of mind and, and the whole notion of what community means today. There's that roadmap we were talking about. Here's the book that I wrote, Beyond the Interstate, Discovering the Hidden America. It dealt with festivals and events, some stories about it, and uh, trying to get beyond the headline and the event title to the soul of it. The, the, here's some slides talking about the field that I'm trying to get at. Uh, before we had convenience stores, I guess that was a, an earlier version. You filled with your bicycle a couple of pennies and you had the, uh, the Coca-Cola machine, the seven up uh, machine and a place to get together. Some of the festivals around the country, this is the, the, the Fiddler's Festival in Metropolis, Illinois, the Superman Festival, when the town goes crazy off all of that theme. I hope the picture is big enough where you can see all the people dressed up in, with the Superman capes. This is uh, Western Days. This one here is, let's see, the Bathtub Festival. With, this is uh, people coming into town and racing in their bathtubs. This is Liberal Kansas. This is Pancake Day. This is on Shrove Tuesday. They have a uh, competition against uh, a town in, in England, and it's done transatlantically. And you see, look at the crowd over there, but that's a tradition around Mardi Gras time in Kansas, and it provides a sense of place there. This is July 4th in a town in Indiana. They have the lawnmower races, and if that picture is big enough, you see them marching down Main Street with, with lawnmowers. This is uh, the Fish House Parade. That's the Friday, the day after uh, Thanksgiving in rural Minnesota, when it marks the start of the ice fishing season. And the houses, I don't remember the Grumpy Old Men movie with Jack Lemmon and Walter Matthau, that, uh, profiled the, the ice house, or the fish house there, and here's the parade that takes place in November. Another event, the National Whistler's Convention in North Carolina. This is the Cowboy Poetry Festival in Elko, Nevada, and uh, brings folks from all over the country. And they had an expansive uh, notion of cowboys and poetry. And it's not just poetry, but music as well. And uh, it's redefined community and in this age of niche. It's a nice bridge between the traditional and, and the contemporary. This is Battle Creek, Michigan. The world's largest breakfast table is touted as. Uh, Battle Creek was the home of uh, Kellogg's and there's a bowl of cereal that will be given. And uh, as I said, you see the Main Street closed up 
and the, the, the world's biggest breakfast table. On the other side is the, the world's shortest St. Patrick's Day parade. This one's in Missouri. The others claim, or actually this one's in Arkansas. There's others in, in Missouri, many of them associated with uh, Irish pubs, but this one was listed as 98 feet long. Imagery, the Oscar Mayer Wiener van uh, traveling around the country. It was a sort of like a C-SPAN bus or an on-the-road van of a different type. And I was trying to get at, uh, as I traveled, I found the remnants of, of times uh, earlier. I, I mentioned to you uh, Hackensack, New Jersey, the, where I used to go in and see the movie in the old movie theater. That was divided up into a tenplex and eventually was demolished. And I saw many of these places around, places like this Bay Shores Cafe, but if you started talking to people locally, it really resonated. There were really memories there and uh, people wanted to talk about it. And I'm hoping that this is that type of environment where folks get to talk about it. This is in Connecticut. And this is a July 4th parade. You can see by the perhaps gaudy, but the, the red, white, and blue colors. And he's holding a little radio, a boom box. And in this town in Connecticut, one year, the band, it was a scheduling problem and the the band it fell between the cracks the the scheduling for the band there was no band and what they did was they, they quickly called up the local radio station and asked if they could play patriotic music and the, the station obliged and folks in and around parade brought out their boom boxes and they marched with their boom boxes and every year it's become a tradition now you see the television cameras but the, the boom box parade for for july 4th this is in Ohio uh, when the turkey vultures return every March. It's uh, when the swallows will come back to Capistrano around that, that same time period. So this is vulture day in, in Ohio when magically the turkey vultures return to town. Again, the imagery of, of the farm. I would drive by and uh, very rarely would I stop when I was with my dad, but I'd have this sense of connection. I don't know if it's from watching Andy Griffith or Lassie, but it's part of, part of the America that I grew up with. And I, I miss that when I'd go along the interstate highways. and. Uh, as, as I spoke to folks, others felt the same way. Traveling along those back roads, you found uh, it wasn't the standard uh, McDonald's. Uh, when Holiday came in, it was a welcome sight for many folks. With, you knew what you were getting, no matter if you were in California, Louisiana, a Holiday Inn was a Holiday Inn. But the individuality along the way uh, started to be lost. And this is a uh, in Montana, a wigwam uh, service station, Standard Oil, which around here at least, later on became an Amico station. Give you an idea in terms of uh, the particularities of a community. This is New Jersey and Hackensack next to me, the Bergen Evening Record, which is now part of the USA Today chain, but that was the, the back door of the newspaper headquarters with the cars lined up there. Uh, in that same town was one of the earliest supermarkets, Packard Bambergers, and it was along a railroad siding. So the, the boxcars would come right in and unload the, the goods there. You notice the distinctive towers. A lot of the early department stores were associated with radio stations. Uh, the Bambergers uh, chain in Newark, New Jersey uh, was one of the earliest radio stations. They took on radio so they could sell their, their radio console units. And in fact, their radio station was one of the first in the New York City area. Similar was Packard Bamberger, it was a supermarket. I remember the dust, uh, dust on the floor there and it had the, the smell of the fresh fresh cheese very different from today it was distinctive and i venture to say that each community there are recollections of, of uh, those landmark stores and those eateries and the like this is another landmark in hackensack the same town which is the county seat white manna hamburgers uh, i don't know how reliable the poll was but recently a poll came out uh, indicating that white manna was the second best hamburger in the country. I don't know if that's true, but what's distinctive about it, this little place, and it, it's as tiny as it looks, it was at the 1939 World's Fair in New York. It was moved to New Jersey across the river in 1946, and it's been in pretty much in the same location ever since. The burgers are okay, but I, uh, they taste that much better because the, the atmosphere is, is pretty good. I've got to tell you, and I hope nobody's listening from there, but the people behind the counter, they've changed ownership maybe five, six, seven times, and each next owner is as surly as the one that was before that. So when you walk in there, there's a whole ritual involved. You're supposed to wait for them to look at you because uh, you, you can't ask for your order unless they acknowledge you first and you can wait 10, 15 minutes. And it's only for burger and fries if you want a drink, meaning soda, not, not a hard drink. But there's another person who takes that order, but you have no way of knowing when you go in there. 
and you're supposed to be patient to wait for the order because good food takes time and it's got its own rituals. But again, you know, I think at the end of the day, as long as you know what you're getting, that's part of the appeal that, that one place isn't like the other. Talking about earlier travel, I'm, my dad used to dress us up. Uh, we traveled by plane. We used to get into the jacket and suit and tie, and we'd arrive at an airport three hours before the plane. That was even before the security measures of 9-11. But here's, this is harken, harkens back to an earlier era, the 707 Clipper. I think that's the 50s and early 60s. Unique places along the way. This is a bookstore uh, from I-84, just below the the Massachusetts border, and it's called the Traveler Food and Books. Foods go okay. Uh, they have home homey food from meatloaf to uh, salads and everything in between. But what's interesting is they have shelves of books, and while you're eating, you can take a book off the shelf and read a book, and you're allowed to take two free books with you. You've got to pay you know pennies or something for any additional books. And downstairs there. Are are new books, not many, but it's a quirky, unique place. And that's, those are the types of places that I look for along the road. Mentioning to you, Oscar Mayer Wiener, inspired by the TV ad, there's the, the van. Uh, the imagery of baseball, something that united us at, at the time. It was a time of daytime World Series. I was weaned and grew up on uh, Lou Gehrig's story there, but that's the old Yankee Stadium, which had uh, you've noticed the copper eyes facade, which was white in this time when it opened in 1923, but by the 1950s and 60s, it had turned green at the time. And uh, you notice on the left center field, Death Valley, they called it, and there were the monuments to the Yankee greats. And uh, Billy Crystal mentioned, which I thought, I thought they were buried out there. It wasn't until later on that uh, came to discover they were just monuments and the, the actual people were, were buried someplace else. Again, the imagery here, the Norman Rockwell inspired it, and this is uh, uh, the four freedoms and uh, freedom of assembly, and that's the, the notion of the town meeting. Uh, the flip side of that is a place in Delaware, Georgetown, Delaware, and it's interesting now with, the, with Delaware in the news because of uh, the recent presidential election, uh, I uh, had a request to do a journey into Delaware, and we're going to ex be exploring. I didn't know much about Delaware. I knew about DuPonts, and I knew about recent uh, headlines, but there's a fascinating history of, of Delaware. But this is one of the events in town, uh, a tradition that goes back is that that pin says 200 years, and it's return day. And that happens two or three days after the election, when both the, uh, the victors and the vanquished get together, and they bury the hatchet. And I guess when I put this together, it was with Thanksgiving in mind in the midst of COVID and everything else going on that we're so isolated and divided in so many ways to, that I wanted to be able to take inventory with you, whether today or in a future session, to mark what we're thankful for. Again, hopping around the country, this notion of Americana and off the beaten path that provides for a sense of place, what distinguishes one place from another. And this is Salem, Massachusetts. Look what they've done. They have an event called Haunted Happenings that takes place around uh, Halloween. But any place you go, this, there's the image of the witch. Uh, that's on the side of a, a, a police car. Jamestown, New York, the home of Lucille Ball. And there's the statues there. This turned out to be the, uh, the, the second take of the statue. The first one, in the eyes of too many, was grotesque. So they redid it and came up with another one. But here's Jamestown. Uh, Lucy used to visit there on occasion in summer, but she's remembered and folks still uh, make a pilgrimage to Jamestown, New York. This is a place in Michigan called Cops and Donuts, a long time bakery in town. And it was starting to fail. It goes back maybe I don't know, 20 years or so ago. And the local police who would stop in every morning to get donuts said, wait, we, we don't want this to fail. And they all chipped in and they, save the bakery and they help uh, rejuvenate it. And I guess I don't watch it much. Uh, other parts of my family watch Food Network, but it's been profiled on Food Network and, and other places. And it's now called Cops and, and Donuts, but it's saved the business, but it also saved that little Main Street as well. Another place, Waterloo, New York. Uh, just like Good Barbecue, uh, there's a dispute as to which is the uh, capital of uh, Memorial Day. Uh, there are different versions that came out of the Civil War in the South. This uh, Waterloo 
says their, their birthplace of Memorial Day, their first event was in 1866. At the time, it was called Decoration Day because they decorated the, the, the uh, grave sites and remembered those that were vanquished in war. This is in Nebraska. I'd done through Sirius XM Radio uh, Journeys into Nebraska. And one of my stories is about this showroom on Main Street, which is empty, it was a gentleman who would restore old cars, uh, sort of like Packards and Oldsmobiles, and they were called orphan cars, so he called it the Orphan Motor Company, and he became a specialist, and he would do that in his backyard. Over time, he needed a bigger space, and there was a, an old Packard dealership in town was lying vacant, and what he did was he restored it, and there's the Orphan Motor Company showroom and uh, service area, and it revolutionized the Main Street in town. Another one of my favorite uh, Nebraska stories is a uh, town in Nebraska where Glenn Miller was a, uh, was, uh, what's, the, what's the word I'm looking for? He was a apprentice in a local band before becoming Glenn Miller. And there was a ballroom in town and the folks in that town have uh, memorialized that. And the Glenn Miller Society, hearing our feature on Sirius XM radio, we're in touch with the local folks and uh, again, talk about pilgrimages that take place. This town in Cambridge, Nebraska, I, I think it was, uh, has become known as the, the home, uh, unofficial, one of the unofficial hometowns of, of Glenn Miller. This is in Oregon. Charles Corot went to visit this place and you can hardly see it, but it was a general store in town and it was known, it was a one traffic light town, but it also was known because it had one parking meter and that one parking meter was in the, at the front of this little store and it brought notoriety to that community as well. What I'm trying to get at with all these slides is that uh, we don't take a trip, but a trip, a trip takes us. So in a time when we've all been isolated at home and uh, in my case, I've been looking back and planning ahead for the, you know, remembering those, those trips off the main roads. This is a the state sign in, I think, Michigan. Uh, getting that feeling. Uh, it was a time when I grew up with, with brands. Uh, there was brand loyalty, whether to a gas or a radio station. In this case, uh, the beer, Ham's Beer, from the, and its slogan was, from the land of sky blue water. And if you take a look at our Ham's Beer videos, you can see from the golden age of television, there were old television ads. To sunrise in Maine, the, the sunset in, uh, I guess, Key West, Florida, or over the Pacific. The idea of we the people, what that, what that means. Uh, again, I'm talking about the institutions and times that we share together. Uh, Derby Day, Kentucky Derby, normally held the beginning of May. It wasn't this year. Stephen Foster, as I get older, yes, there are cer certain lyrics in there that, that don't necessarily stand the test of time, but there's some beautiful songs. I was watching recently the, the Civil War series uh, from PBS, goes back almost 30 years ago, but the Stephen Foster music and how, how, it, how it resonates. That's the book I mentioned earlier, uh, finding the, you know, the idea of finding the heart and soul. This is the Labor Day trek across the uh, Mackinac uh, Bridge in northern, uh, northern Michigan uh, by the peninsula. They close down the bridge and folks come from near and far to walk across the bridge together. It marks the end of summer. One of the songs that I recall from my folks was the, from that World War II period, Dear Hearts and Gentle People. Bob Hope did a record uh, recalling that era and that was after Thanks for the Memories, that was one of the songs that he recalled. The quirkiness of America. How do you, how do you like that as a, an abode there, a wintertime abode? Again, I was mentioning earlier the idea of barbecue and uh, barbecue and chili are two topics that I go through very carefully because they're it's very personal to people where the best barbecues to be found uh, from Carolina version to Texas to, uh, to Kansas City. So hopefully maybe we could do a session just on that. This is a July 4th event where they, they have the song competition. This is the Delta Blues Festival in, in Mississippi. The Western Swing Festival in Texas. Uh, I, I love Western Swing music. It says the bridge between country music and, and swing music. And, uh, you know, Western Swing is both and to, to break the two down. Uh, this is a full foliage festival that takes place in Vermont, but it's not in one community. It's a rolling festival that progresses over a week to 10 days as the leaf line goes from north to south. And uh, each village has its own unique uh, observa observance and, and celebration in that. 
This is in Angels Camp, California, based upon the Mark Twain story, the jumping frog of Calaveras County. And look at that the frog jumping there. Uh, one of my other favorite events is on the Delmarva Peninsula in, in uh, east, the east coast of Maryland is the, the crab races that take place in, uh, on Labor Day. This is dances for the Basque Festival taking place in Nevada, and uh, distinctive culture there. In the Midwest, in doing research for my book, Beyond the Interstate, I came to discover that corn husking was a major league event at the time. So I don't know if you ever watched ESPN. They have a hot dog eating contest on July 4th. Uh, I participated, uh, or I went to see it one year, and I, I didn't get past four myself, but the winner is up to like 70 something hot dogs. And uh, the, the corn husking contest back in the 1930s, that was on that, that same level of the hot dog contest there, uh, or cheerleading competitions. But tens of thousands of people would converge. And that this was to remember the National Corn Husking Contest in 1934. Opening day in New York for Yankee Stadium, I showed you a picture before. This is the vintage subway train that rolls out uh, once a year. Notice the pennants on the front. I think they do it twice a year, once when the Mets start and once when the Yankees start. But that's a 1920s subway train that, that rolls up to Yankee Stadium from, from Manhattan just on that day. Louis Armstrong does it for me and have the ambassador of American jazz and American music in the 1950s. Uh, he's gone some, what, 50, almost 50 years, and, uh, but he's one of those musical art forms that represents America to me. This is a feature that Charles Kuralt did of Thanksgiving, talking about a, a family in Mississippi who uh, went from rags to riches of doctors in the family, PhDs, and if you ever get the chance to watch it, say Charles Kuralt, Thanksgiving, Google it, it brings tears to my eyes, but it, it's the best of what we're all about as, as a country. Again, the imagery of Main Street. Uh, this is a reality check for me because I start showing these cute pictures of Main Street, but more often this is what I find uh, and what prompted me to, to do that search beyond the interstate. There's the Burger King, there's the McDonald's, uh, the CVS, and uh, going from one place to another as I travel look in search of that authentic America, I found the Wendy's and the McDonald's most often, and this is more locally here in New Jersey, the, the omnipresent Burger King, again, seeing the USA, which prompted me from a culinary point of view, looking for things that wouldn't necessarily be found along the, that, that strip there. And here are some foods. Don't know if you have your own contributions, if any of these uh, are familiar to you, Coney Island Plains, a hot dog, the Speedy Sam. Beef on Weck is from Buffalo. Tomato pie is in Trenton, New Jersey. Five-way chili in Cincinnati, pasties, and uh, Rocky Mountain oysters each has a, a story of its own. But, uh, and I have took notes in case I, I've forgotten if we have time, wait, perhaps we can get into some of them. The regional differences. Does your neck of the world talk about fireflies or lightning bugs? Do you talk about garage sale, rummage sales, tag sales, or yard sales? If you're greeting you all, you guys use you all or yins. Do you drink Coke, pop, soda, coca, co coke, uh, coca, coca, loa, right? or a soft drink? Is it a trash can or a garbage can? Is it a semi, semi truck, track, or tracker trailer, 18 wheeler, water fountain, drinking fountain, or bubbler? Is it sneakers, tennis shoes, gum shoes, or shoes? Caramel or caramel? And again, one of the features that I enjoyed from Charles Corral was the uh, unique places. And here's just some of them. Hopefully, you can through chat or future sessions, we can have an exchange on that too. Bug Tussle, Octagon, Y Arizona, Dog Patch, Arkansas, Last Chance, Colorado, Flush, Kansas, Monkey's, Monkey's Eyebrow, Accident, Maryland, Hot Coffee, Mississippi, there's Mayberry, North Carolina, Horseheads, New York, Zap, Gene Autry, Oklahoma, and Bump Ass, Virginia, just some of them. Uh, as I was preparing this, I was doing it with South Dakota in mind, and it was interesting, but uh, one of the quotes I found was, Shh, don't tell anyone, but South Dakota is something of a Midwest secret. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm from New Jersey, and uh, we could do a separate session about the stereotypes as opposed to the reality of New Jersey, but uh, this WPA guide, it was interesting. And if anybody's from South Dakota, maybe you can let me know in terms of the accuracy, but this is a quote in there. It says, throughout South Dakota, a stranger will notice in cities along the highways, a human familiarity like that of a small village. On the streets, the resident speaks to nearly everyone. 
and calls by their first names half of those he meets. Visitors will often find themselves being greeted on the street by natives with whom they've had only the most casual contact. South Dakotans pride themselves on the number of their acquaintances over the state. Only in South Dakota, some of the things to be found there. Wall drug, water, pickle beer, red beer, the Rushmore taffy, uh, mountain taffy, wasna, kuchin, and chisley, and I'll get back into that in a bit. And the culture of uh, the U.S. state of South Dakota exhibits influences from many different sources, American Indians, to so the cultures of the American West, the Midwest, and the customs and traditions of many of the state's various immigrants groups have all contributed to South Dakota art, music, and literature. And some of the highlights, I, it's interesting, I, I did a Wikipedia to look at some of the highlights, and I guess in order to get to the things beyond the interstate and off the beaten path, here's what the Wikipedia and the sources talk about, about Laura Ingalls Wilder. Uh, the Little House on the Prairie. It was an uh, old uh, Edvard Wolvog, a uh, Norwegian immigrant, and uh, he's studying English, and he wrote a num large number of novels. Uh, and a, a couple of other favorite sons' art played a role as well in, in South Carolina. Top sports figures from, from oh, South Carolina, South Dakota, excuse me. Uh, the three that three top that I came across was Billy Miles. He won the 10,000 meter track title in the uh, Olympics in 1964, and he set a world record for six miles at 27.11.6. Frank Leahy, the Notre Dame football coach from 1941, 1943, and then 1946 to 53, and six undefeated seasons and one national titles. And then there's Garney Henley, a uh, Canadian Football League All Star. Interesting, I came across Bighorn, a film about Custer and football, and uh, its filmmaker was an Italian immigrant from South Dakota and the great, great daughter of, uh, uh, well, actually, the, the, he's the great, great grandfather of Super Bowl winning kicker, Adam Bettinari. But uh, Bighorn is an interesting film there I call to your attention. Some images more locally about Vermilion and uh, the settlement and the role of Native Americans, pioneers, front, uh, frontiersmen, farmers, and merchants who made the area home. And I guess important times in the local history were the European settlement, of course, the university, the arrival of the railroad, the bluff, the floods, the fire. And I guess I'm trying to open up to you in terms of reconciling contradictory parts of, uh, of history and redefinition in this time when so much is changing, the idea of I didn't want to just speak about nostalgia and history, but I'm trying to tie the dots together from where we came from, the pride and what we had, to taking inventory where we are and where we might be going together beyond just the headlines that we hear. Some local images, Main Street, and I guess a quote that I found was uh, the local claim to fame, Lewis and Clark visited there and shot their first buffalo. And they looked around and supposedly observed that, uh, that all the land here was pretty flat, that's what the observation was. And there's the, the imagery. There's the university. Wall Drug, which is, a, I guess, a tourist site. Um, as I said, I'm passing through that so we can get beyond it. The, the open road, what it represents. And uh, I guess back east here, I love a, an empty beach, just the waves and the imagery. And look at the vastness of it. You know, you see the person and just this is inspiring. Uh, the influence of seeking gold, what that's done on, on history. This is Chisley. And you guys, I'm hoping you can tell me about that. I have uh, something else, uh, another slide we race through to show you later, so more imagery in the state. The festivals are often what define us, and South Dakota, something called the Fest Quest, exploring small town celebrations across the Rushmore State. And two of the biggest events are the days of 76, recalling the, uh, the, the, the culture, the Western culture. And again, this is uh, the Yanktown Riverboat Days, the role of the river and some scenes, and this is the, the Corn Palace, uh, the, the world famous Corn Palace. There were some in smaller towns, but I guess, uh, look at the, uh, the, the side of all, and how that's done, talk about artwork, and I'm in awe anytime I, I see that too, but you know, hopefully maybe we can share Corn Palace stories. Some of the roadside artifacts, the giant pheasant. This is the center of the country monument. This is Rapid City, they have uh, these, statues that honor various American presidents. This is Frank's Days Bar Motel and Museum. It's not your normal holiday inn sign. 
This is the, the Land of Oz. Look at the Wizard of Oz characters. And there again, the open road. This is a graffiti alley. I believe again, that's in Rapid City. This is a movie theater that goes back over a century. This is the Art Deco vintage of it, but uh, the role of the small, of the movies in small towns. This is Chisley and Chislick, and I'm hoping you can share with me. This is the annual Chislick Festival. Uh, this is a link to a, uh, to a site that talks about how this town gained its uh, fame through its uh, annual Chislick Festival. Again, the university in town, this collection of, of violins. And uh, thanks to the folks at the library. Here's some, uh, looking back, some images locally. Main Street, that's, I guess, 1940s, early 1950s. This is the Dakota House. Some local images there, the university. Again, the, the Clay County Courthouse. How do you like that for a load? And uh, they're waiting for AAA to arrive on that. But, uh, and again, here's the late 50s version of the Main Street. And again, this, this happens to be in South Dakota, but it could be any town and trying to tap into that. Notice the, the drugstore there. One of the images that I think I skipped over is uh, this small drugstore in Missouri. And folks used to come in every morning and Charles Corral did a feature on it so he had, he, where this place had a, a coffee club. And the regulars would come in and if you came in a certain number of times, you'd have your own personalized mug. And uh, Corral visited there and the, behind the counter were virtually dozens, if not hundreds of mugs there. And it was about the coffee, it was about the mugs, but it was about the, the notion of community. And, and these are some of the features of Kuralt, uh features that I really liked. And the story of a man who kept a garage full of bicycles that he lent to neighbors, uh, the neighborhood children who couldn't afford their own bicycle, the man who powered his car on cord cobs, or the town of North Platte, Nebraska, whose stopover canteen fed millions of World War II troop trains. Uh, Doug Duncan wrote uh, in a small newspaper, he said, you, you know, you're in a small town when you dial a wrong number and you talk for 15 minutes anyway. And uh, again, I was mentioning earlier about the Mississippi sharecroppers who managed to send all of their nine children to college. And that was that Thanksgiving feature. So here, uh, I'm, trying, I'm hoping to, to leave you guys some time here too, but uh, trying to take these stories and turn it into what we call a smart narrative, whether it's a smart American narrative, a smart community narrative, but each town has its own story of stories to tell, part of its history, part culture, but it's also the sum of little things, neighborliness, community, why something matters in one place that might not matter in the next town, what makes a place unique, what makes it special, what a community special sauce is, and what makes for a sense of place? As I said, it's more than red and blue, but it's, it's part of our American experience. So with that in mind, I want to thank Rochelle, you, and hope that I left you a little time just to say hello and that, to start the conversation. Again, this was to lay the foundation. There were some 150 slides, and again, it was just as a survey to plant the seed. And next time, maybe it won't be me just talking and I won't be speaking as fast, but I hope I created some creativity in, in our minds that perhaps we can have a conversation together and we can have a show and tell sort of what makes a place or what makes America special for us and to rekindle some of those conversations that harken into that period of that, that Perry Como YouTube that I was watching earlier or Charles Corralt or in search of the perfect Main Street. So with that all in mind, I want to acknowledge the Book of 50 States, the Roadside America, that WPA guide I mentioned all, earlier and also especially the, the, the public library. So. Take care and stay safe. And in this time of uh, isolation, I'm hope maybe with the, uh, you know, I'm glad we can get together and maybe we, we can do it again. So with that, I'm spent and open it up to all of you to tell you what, tell me what you think and maybe we can share it together. Thank you very much, Eric. So I've got a few comments uh, from the chat that I wanted to share. Luann mentioned Stucky's, which I guess is a restaurant, a local restaurant for her. Um, I'm not sure where that is. Um, I've never heard of Stuckey's. Um, in South Carolina, uh, there is a town called North. So um, North South Carolina. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, and Phyllis said from in New Hampshire, uh, there is a Supreme, Supreme Court justice uh, named David Souter, who right. is from North Ware. So he is... Like, I guess if you abbreviate North, he's from nowhere. <laughs> and 
And then um, Sarah says she uses the Roadside America app. Right, right. To access that kind of stuff. So yeah, that was interesting. I wanted to talk about a couple of stories, but it was interesting doing this back in the '90s. There was a town in Montana, and I, I used to participate in the Main Street program from the National Trust for Historic Preservation, and they have their this whole way of analyzing towns and taking inventory. But what the story that I heard was that a town that wanted to introduce themselves and they didn't want it from the outsiders like Roadside America or this guy from New Jersey talking today about South Dakota. But uh, what, what happened in this community was they had fifth graders in a local elementary school and I'm dating myself in terms of time, but they took out Polaroid cameras and they gave each of the students a camera to go around the community and take pictures uh, talking about what was special to them and they put it together with a couple of lines there and they put it into a booklet that they made available at the Visitors Bureau, the Welcome to Our Community. And it was as if they were talking to a friend or a family member who was coming, a family member they would talk to, but someone they were gonna show their, their hometown to. And uh, Roadside America is nice, but it, what I don't necessarily like, it, it talks about the quirkiness, but I'm hoping here to have discussions from the inside out, from what, what moves us as, a, as opposed to people who, you know, looking for the quirkiness. One person's weird and strange, it insults me for people from the outside to say that is weird or strange because it's special to me and it's something that's heartfelt in terms of whether my individual qualities or whether the qualities of my hometown. So I'm hoping we can get discussions as to what's special in an endearing way. The roadside of America is good, but I, I welcome the opportunity to hear from you was, was the case of North South Carolina, you know, that. <laughs> It's about our place and about our story. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about Stuckey's Hot Shops is another one that was along the highways along with uh, Howard Johnson's. It's interesting here in New Jersey, we're getting our second Krispy Kreme and it'll be interesting to know because that was rooted in the South. We have a lot of Dunkin' Donuts and Starbucks and mm -hmm. the whole demographics are very different between Dunkin' Donuts <laughs> and Starbucks. And it'll be interesting to see where Krispy Kreme occupies uh, in terms of donut preferences and just in terms of people grabbing coffees and in that whole pecking order of uh, you know, just just where it lands. So, but uh, and one one other thing, one other place that I don't know if anybody's ever heard of the Triple X restaurant in Lafayette, Indiana, but uh, uh, the, the X doesn't stand for X rated, but it's a uh, place that serves burgers and root beer. I think it's in Lafayette, but uh, the home of uh, Purdue University, it's a college town and uh, special burgers, but it, it Held just as white manna did for me, the local burgers. Uh, you know, there there are those triple X restaurants, and hoping hopefully maybe we can bring that together. When I travel, I like to get off the highway and find those little places that whether diners or coffee shops or greasy spoons that you can mm -hmm. get local conversations, local specialties. The the case in South Carolina, we we stop off, we can get this fried okra, and it's wonderful. It's just a tremendous meal. We look forward to. It driving to Florida, not for the Florida bar part, but being able to stop in South Carolina. Right. Let's see, uh, Linda, uh, uh, Linda says they have a Stuckey's in Wilmington, Illinois. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Luann had said Stuckey's was one of the first restaurants, uh, road stops across several states. Yeah, again, I mean, I've, I've never personally heard of it. I've been in Washington State and Southern California and South Dakota. Those are the places I've lived and I, it's interesting those those things that are very much staples to people you know in their parts of the country that just are um, in this case unheard of to other people from other places. And, and Stuckey's like the Hot Shops and the Howard Johnson's they were along the toll roads back east oh, and okay. they were limited access roads so unlike the, the, the beyond the interstate where you had the problem was you know, you, you could go miles without a gas station or a, a restaurant and God forbid your car broke down in the age before AAA. But if you were on that limited access highway, whether it was the New Jersey Turnpike, the New York State Thruway, the Ohio Turnpike, you had rest areas there. And uh, the Garden State Parkway was fascinating in New Jersey because when they built it, trucks weren't allowed. And we had people, my grandparents, that would take our Sunday ride just to go on the Garden State Parkway. And they had picnic areas <laughs> where you would bring a picnic basket and you would get dressed up to take a ride in the car and then you take out your picnic basket and, <laughs> and have a picnic on the garden state not on the rest stop not on the highway but on on the rest the, the rest <laughs> stop, the picnic area on the garden state parkway but stuckies and hot shops and, and and howard johnson's took on a mythical role they were the pre-mcdonald's mcdonald's so to speak because they were limited access highways it was considered progress part of the motor age 
and too many of us, I was driving to, to Baltimore, to Maryland not too long ago, and I remember when my dad's car broke down and we were stuck at an Esso station for 12 hours. So I, you'll have mixed memories of Stuckey's and the Esso station. <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway. So hopefully we can get at some of that, but you know that's why it resonated because it was special in terms of innovation, but but it was a limited access. It wasn't everywhere at that time. Right. I've got a comment from Lynn who says Bullsburg Center County and Bullsburg and Center County, uh, Pennsylvania lays claim to being the birthplace of uh, decoration now Memorial Day. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> as three ladies decorated. Okay, as three ladies decorated the graves of Union soldiers in the Bullsburg Cemetery on October 1864, and there has been the laying of flowers there every Memorial Day since. The story is documented in the 14th uh, Pennsylvania uh, vol Vols Volumes, I, <laughs> um, Regimental History, first published in 1904. Today it is an annual Memorial Day weekend celebration. <laughs> yep, there, there it is. So, I mean, there are certain topics that you just throw out there without passing judgment. One is uh, best barbecue, another one is best chili. <laughs> Another one is the origins of Memorial Day. And even it goes down to the Groundhog Capital, uh, Puxatawney, okay. Pennsylvania, but there's uh, there's others in Wisconsin and uh, other locations around the country that lay claim that they're the capital. We could do mm -hmm. a session on capitals of and <laughs> see how many different places claim that. Uh, right. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we're kind of, it's one o'clock now. We should probably start wrapping up. Uh, we have one more comment. Uh, Someone uh, says uh, should stop at Stuckey's for their pecan logs. <laughs> so uh, if you are ever near a Stuckey's, uh, we have a recommendation for their pecan logs. <laughs> planting a seed before we go. We're planting a seed for perhaps a future session. We're talking about wall drugs as a tourist destination. Destination. There's a place south of the border, which is in uh, back east of South Carolina. And if you're driving on I-95, you see virtually hundreds of miles away billboards starting to tout <laughs> south of the border. And I'm still trying to determine whether the billboards um, fulfill the billing in advance there, that when you actually get there, whether you're fulfilled by the actual being there or whether you build up such, such anticipation about the idea of being there. But uh, <laughs> wonder if there are other similar types of places. And uh, there are smaller amusement parks, and that would be fascinating too if anybody wants to weigh in, if people want to do this in the future. But there are pre-Disney and how Disneyland took aspects from these various amusement parks and what was life was like, whether it was Coney Island in New York, Coney Island in, in Ohio, or the local versions were very often were at the end of trolley lines because the trolley lines were owned by electric companies and they wanted you to take their trolleys out there and they would light up the amusement parks with all sorts of neon lights and uh, to make an experience. But lots of seeds to be planted. I hope that you had a, an enjoyable time. Again, thank you for allowing us to get together. I'm hoping this is the foundation for making community and sharing together our passions. And again, everyone stay, stay safe and uh, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year and, and stay well. All right. Thank you very much, Eric. And thank you everyone else for attending. And well, we'll see you later. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>